I appreciate the invitation and I'm um, excited to be talking to you all about um, berries and managing strawberry pests and diseases. Um, as Jenna said, I am the Western New York berry or small fruit specialist and I'm a part of the Harvest New York regional team. And so it's Harvest New York is a team that's comprised of specialists from across the state who focus on um, maybe some of the more unusual aspects of um, food production. So we've got some urban specialists who are working in New York City. There's folks who are working on um, dairy processing uh, things and then also um, fruits and vegetables and that's kind of where I fit in. Um, and so and I've been with this program for about two years now, almost three, and um, I'm yeah, based in Erie County, but I cover all of Western New York. Um, and then it's kind of diving into the, the program. Um, I'm hoping to introduce some of the common pests and diseases of strawberries and just give you a timeline of when in the season you should be looking for various problems and then provide some suggestions for cultural management um, so we start with that, with the cultural control and then moving to when is it necessary to manage with chemicals? Because sometimes you need to bring out um, some of those other tools. Mostly I'm gonna be giving in, in this talk some organic suggestions and that's because they're usually safer for handling um, for you as the the grower or gardener, and then also safer on the beneficial insects and pests um, or insects that are going after the pests. And that just you know, allows you to have to use fewer chemicals by allowing some of those natural um, biological control systems to continue to work. Um, I will say that often conventional pesticides are more effective than the organic options, but that the, the conventional ones that you're going to see in the stores um, are usually kind of the old school broad spectrum ones um, that they, they are effective, um, but they're, they're just going to kill everything. And there are much more specialized pesticides now that um, commercial growers use that will only take out the specific pest of concern and are softer on the beneficials. But those are often very cost prohibitive, you know, even if you could find them, you know, like $300 for a little bottle that they're then mixing into a big tank. Um, so again, you know, we're going to be looking at mostly these organic ones. Um, and then the foundation of all of this, and you've probably talked about this many times before in your Master Gardener programs of IPM. And the goal is to only be controlling or spraying for the pests and diseases that are present. So no need to just go out and think, well, maybe I have something and prevent it. Know what you have. Um, and then, you know, maybe something's present, but it's, it's just there. Maybe it eats a little, but it's not really hurting your yields or, um, you know, the crop that you're trying to get. So there's, you know, a threshold for economic injury of, you know, is this affecting the use of the, the crop? And then if possible, as I mentioned, use cultural controls versus chemicals. And a part of this is really understanding what you have going on in your planting. So scouting is the, a piece of that. And then, you know, identifying what you're seeing. So not just there's a bug, well, what kind of bug and how do you manage it? Is this the appropriate time? Um, so and that's part of what this uh, talk will be about is finding out what's out there in your strawberries. And so usually what I recommend with scouting strawberries, and this can work on a commercial scale and this can be, you know, in, in a few plants in your backyard or even in a pot if you're growing them. And so if you're growing um, Sort of a sort of the traditional system for here in New York of these matted row overwintering strawberries. Um, they're just starting to come out of the crowns um, in April or early May. Um, the the straw mulch was probably removed in March, 
Um, so you take that off and then you're starting to see, you get some warmer days, starting to see some leaves and stuff emerging. And the tools are very simple. Um, you have this a jeweler's loop or a hand lens of some kind, and then a simple plastic plate. Um, this is a lid from like a yogurt container that I used. Um, and these are like $5 a piece. So the, the jeweler's loops um, and the plastic plates or lids are free from <laughs> recycling. And so the process would be is to move diagonally across the field to, and you can do this on whatever scale, I would say 50 to 100 leaves if I was in a commercial field. Um, or it could just be a couple of leaves if you have a few plants. And then you look underneath, you flip those leaves over and you look with the lens very closely to see what you find. And I'll be look, showing you on the next few slides the kinds of things to be looking for. Um, once you have flower clusters emerging, you then want to look at those carefully. And this is where that uh, lid or plate comes in is you put that there and then you have the flower clusters and you sort of tap or beat the clusters over that plate and then see what falls out. And you'd be surprised how many bugs can pop out of some flowers that look like they're fine. Um, and then just be observing for other issues of, um, are there places where the plants are dying or there looks like there's spots on the leaves or you know just anything that looks unusual. Um, and then do this once or twice a week from the time those leaves are coming out all the way through harvest. So in this early spring period, when things are just starting to come out, we're looking for a number of diseases and a number of pests. And I'll go through these each in more detail. The first is strawberry clipper or strawberry bud weevil. And you just see, uh, let's see if I can pull up my pointer here. Um, this kind of thing where the buds will be clipped off and, and tipped over. Um, and often you'll see it on the sides of fields. Um, it's, you often don't see the weevils, but if you look closely, you might. Um, and then you're really more likely to see the damage than to see the bug. Um, and if you are going to spray for it, the, the threshold in terms of economic damage would be to say more than one injured flower truss per fruit of row. So this is a truss. Um, so if you just see one and you're like, oh, it's just one single bug that wandered in, don't worry about it. If you're seeing three or four or whatever, then you know it might be time to spray because you know there's clearly an outbreak. Um, this is a, and I will say, I don't see it this often. This isn't even one of my pictures because I had to borrow it from someone else's presentation. I just don't see this pest very often in commercial fields. It might be more common in garden settings um, if you're not using any kind of chemical control, um, but it is one to, to be aware of. This one, uh, two spotted spider mites, you probably have seen this in your gardening adventures because it's a very common pest. So you got this two spotted spider mite and then the cyclamen mite over here. So these two spot mites, if you're looking at in the early spring, um, this is a picture I took of they're reddish because they're, this is their overwintering form. They're kind of red. Later in the summer, they're going to be more greenish. Um, but if you kind of zoom in on those with your lens, you're going to see, again, this little mite with the two black spots. Um, and and this is a very heavy infestation that I found in a field in Wyoming County. And the grower had no idea that he had some of these here. So um, he was able to get out and, and manage that before the plants got much bigger. The other common mite that we see are cyclamen mites. And they're so tiny that you really cannot, I've never really seen them with a a lens in the field. It's more of a microscope kind of pest. Um, but the damage is this, this crinkling, uh, you know, sort of failure to expand in the leaves. Um, it's, you know, pretty diagnostic. You know, if you're seeing this kind of damage where the plants, you know, the leaves are not opening up and they're just small and crinkly in the middle, like this, if it's crinkled and 
and not growing on the edges, that can be a nutrient deficiency. But when it looks like this and it's the whole leaf that's affected, that's often cyclamen mite. Um, in terms of cyclamen mite, if you see any presence, any symptom like that, you're gonna need to get out there and do something because they spread rapidly and they're really challenging to manage. So you don't want it to take over your entire field or your whole planting because at that point you may just have to take it out because they're really hard to get rid of. Um, for the two spotted spider mite, um, you can sometimes see it from the leaf surface if the leaves look kind of bronzed or yellowish. Um, you can just flip them over because the mites are almost always on the underside of the leaf. Um, and then you're looking for at least, if there are five mites per leaf, so if you look back at this picture, we're way over the threshold. It's time to manage that pest. Um, there are predatory mites, um, sort of beneficial mites that you can release that will help suppress the populations and kind of manage that before you have to bring in a spray. Um, those are only for low populations. Once there's a big population, they just cannot eat enough uh, to get it under control. And there are chemical control options, different miticides that work. So I would say for this, if you see you have an issue and you're like, I need to spray something for it, this would be the time to uh, maybe call Janice or call me um, and you know, talk about what you might be able to use because they're a mite, they're not an insect. And so some of the insecticides don't work on mites and there's specific miticides. Um, the other thing to think about in terms of preventing this, sort of the cultural control, if you're over fertilizing, that becomes, and there's just lush growth, they love that. Um, and can tend to show up. And then also they seem to like powdery mildew. So if you're not managing a powdery mildew problem, I often see that um, kind of overlapping with mites as well as, I didn't write it in here, um, but dusty conditions for some reason might seem to, if, if the soil is really dusty or if you haven't managed to you know, have a cover you know, between your plants, Sometimes I see more mites in those settings. Um, so this is uh, the next pest is thrips. And these are usually Western flower thrips. Um, and we see them in, on flowers in the spring and a few are not a big deal, but if you get a lot, you start to see this symptom of this bronzed, even cracking, um, cause there's sucking fluids from the cells um, in the developing berry. And as those berries then swell, the skin and the tissues don't work properly and they crack. Um, in, in an ideal situation, there are natural enemies that are taking care of the thrips populations, um, but sometimes they do flare out of control. Um, and we say, so, and this is where that tapping piece comes from. So going back to what I was saying about the scouting, this is a picture that I took. It's not very clear, um, but it's really tells you all you need to know. Um, when you tap those flower clusters over that plate, you're gonna end up with, you'll see these cigar shaped bodies with you know little antenna. They move fast, so they'll just zip around. So that's one way you can tell it apart. And again, if you use your lens and look at them, they're um, kind of a little grayish, bug and they have little stripes on on their um, thorax there so you know they um, are pretty distinctive um, there are so certainly some insecticides that are labeled for thrips there are other insecticides believe it or not that if you're spraying them to manage other issues <clears throat> they don't affect the thrips and they you because you've then take maybe taken out some of the um, beneficial natural enemies that the thrips will then explode out of control. Um, so even if you're spraying insecticides, if you're a grower, you know, and again, that's another reason not to overuse an insecticide unless you think you or know you have a problem. Um, and then in terms of organic, so in trust is an organic insecticide and as a directin, which has many products, those, um, can be used against thrips. Um, and then these biological controls, these are different kinds of um, 
beneficials. Um, so this is what she would look for is aureus, cucumerus, or swirsky um, are different kinds of mites and other beneficial bugs uh, that can be that you can buy and release on or near your plants uh, to uh, handle thrips problems. So the next pest is a, another very common one that I see a lot of. Um, you can certainly find the bug. Um, this is a tarnished plant bug and or sometimes people refer to it as a ligus bug. And it's kind of a largish, um, almost a beetle looking thing, but it is a true bug. Um, and then you've probably seen this damage of what we refer to as cat facing, where the seeds don't develop normally. And so you have this malformed, seedy tips, really ugly, uh, mangled looking berries. Um, and I see this a lot, particularly in organic fields. Uh, this is a very destructive pest um, and can continue throughout the summer as long as there are strawberries. So they don't have a single life cycle. They have a life cycle, as you see here, every month or so, depending on the weather. Um, so you start in early spring before bloom because the feeding that they're doing is on the flowers or the small green fruit and then it's affecting it as it grows. Um, and again, this is one of the things you're looking for as you're tapping those flowers over your dish. Um, and if you see one or more nymphs on four out of 15 flower clusters that you're looking at. Um, and they do have different, they look a little different. This is a young one. So this greenish one, that's a, an immature nymph stage. And then this is more the adult form there. Um, <clears throat> in terms of organic things that you might spray. And this is a really common bug. So you probably are seeing it. So again, some of that economic control, if you don't care about a few damaged berries, then you're fine, whatever. But if you, and it can be every single berry on your plant. So if that is <laughs> upsetting and, you know, if you're hoping to share them with family and just not have this, it's not just ugly, it's, it's hard to eat to have that CD tip. The rest of the fruit you could eat, sure. Um, you know, kind of eat around it or cut it off. Um, but it's certainly not something to be showing off to the, you know, to the neighbors or the garden club. So um, there are some organic options. There's, it's a strange name, but I think this is the, the trade name is PFR 97. Um, Grandivo is a biological product. And Microtrol is another biological controlled product that you want to get out there um, and, you know, just before bloom, um, if you can, and then maybe just after petal fall, because we try to avoid putting out any kind of um, insecticides during bloom uh, to, to protect our bees. These products are going to be pretty soft on bees anyhow. Um, so because again, organic and also the, how they work, they're not going to be as bad. But again, you know, just as a practice to avoid. Um, and we'll talk about that in the bloom section. Um, aphids, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, the biggest issue with aphids on strawberries is, you know, if you've got really heavy populations, you get sticky honeydew. Um, the bigger issue, as I was going to say, is that they vector um, some strawberry viruses. So if you're having your planting in place for multiple years, you do not want those viruses to start building up. Um, <clears throat> and the best products for aphids are Grandivo, that PFR 97 again, or this um, Belief, which is, I think it's not certified organic, but it's a very aphid focused kind of soft chemical. Um, so now moving to diseases to be looking for, um, we're concerned about leaf spot. So there's several that they kind of act the same. So these various leaf funguses. So this is the first one. Um, so that was leaf spot. This is leaf scorch. Um, and sometimes you can have all of them at the same time. So it looks very similar. The main thing here is that the um, these spots say, stay kind of that dark purple, where in the leaf uh, spot here, they turn gray in the middle. So they start out as kind of a solid, but then they 
kind of turn into that bullseye pattern. And then finally leaf blight. And the piece here is it tends to make these kind of deep V-shaped lesions. And this one will also affect the fruit. The others tend not to affect the fruit. Um, so those are the fungus leaf diseases. This is a bacterial leaf disease. Um, and it's called angular leaf spot or Xanthomonas fragarii. Um, and you see here this kind of water soaked lesion um, that's kind of limited to sort of, you can see these edges because it's kind of hanging out between the veins. Um, and because it's a bacteria and not a fungus, fungicides won't work. So if you have this issue and you go to the store to look for something to use on it, don't get a fungicide because it will not touch it. Um, the things that work here are copper. There's various copper formulations. There's plenty of them are organic um, or some kind of sterilant like a oxidate or rendition. And those basically just kind of blast the, the surface and um, will kill those bacteria. Um, so we've wrap this section up of the early spring. So the things you're looking for, you know, before you have flowers, before you have fruit, these are what you wanna have an eye out for. And then the things to, to do in terms of management are if you're seeing the leaf spot, leaf scorch, leaf blight, um, get some fungicide sprays out there. If it's bad, I mean, if it's just a few spots and you don't think it's really hurting your plants, that's fine, but if you had a, a lot of it in a previous season and you really want to avoid having that affect your plants quite so much, um, an early fungicide spray will help that. If you have that angular leaf spot, um, copper, hydrogen peroxide, and then if you're seeing past particularly those thrips or the tarnished plant bug, and of course those two spotted mites are probably the most common, um, if they're over the threshold levels, um, look into getting something out there because those are gonna um, really affect your plants throughout the season. Um, and then this is sort of this, there's a narrow window of, you've got those flower clusters out there, um, but we're not quite into bloom yet. Um, so, and that can last from a week to two weeks. And so it's all the same stuff that we've talked about with a few additional ones, which I'll cover here, um, so spittle bugs, and I'm sure you've probably seen these on weeds and whatever out in the, um, the hedgerows and the fields, uh, but they also affect strawberries and can be, can build up to levels that are destructive. Um, so you start seeing these nymphs appearing in April and May, um, and they suck the juices and then they, um, you know, make these spittle masses and um, it can be challenging in strawberries and they can even stunt the plants. Um, so if you're seeing more than one mass per foot of row, so that's your threshold. So if you see a, a little here, a little there, it can be less pleasant for harvesting, um, but it's probably not worth controlling. Um, here's a very serious disease, um, so gray mold. And I'm sure you've seen it on, on strawberries or other berries. It can get bad on raspberries. Um, so you get your fuzzy gray mold. And the, the big thing here is that the time when it's susceptible is actually at bloom. So that's the time you need to be protecting those flowers because you can kind of see here, these lesions are kind of mostly starting up under the calyx. Um, where you know it's kind of right by where that flower was, um, and then it spreads from there. And it can certainly spread. You know, if you have infected uh, berries like this, it'll certainly spread to the the berries next to it. Um, so for the most effective control, you have to do it during bloom, and you we usually recommend at 10 to 20% bloom. So you're just starting to see the first blossoms coming out. So you get a protective spray out there and then 10 days later. Um, if you want to do more of a cultural control, there is some interesting research that shows that applications of potassium silicate, so a spray 
of it's basically a fertilizer, um, but a, you know particular nutrients that seem to um, help the plants protect themselves. And then in terms of organic options to use, there's these products like double nickel, serenade, quava, which is a copper, howler, stargus, botrystop, botector. These are new, this botrystop and botector, and they seem very promising, more effective than a lot of the other organic options. Um, and then in terms of less effective things that you might be seeing, um, at your home gardening stores are some of these oils or horticultural soaps. They will say they're for uh, fung fungus protection, but they're just less effective. Um, powdery mildew, you're probably well aware of this. Um, it is quite common in strawberries. The symptoms you may see initially are these leaves curling upwards. So you can just look out and you can think, well, maybe are they is it too dry? Do I need to water? But it's actually powdery mildew. And then as it advances, you'll start to see um, it's more of this purple lesion look. And then if you spray a fungicide, that can just turn brown and look kind of scorched. Um, it's kind of funny with strawberries. I don't often see, you know, like that true white powdery mildew look um, that you might see on like your lilac plants or on your squashes. Um, it tends to have a slightly different appearance on strawberries, but, and it's, it is a different strain of the powdery mildew fungus. Um, it's more common under tunnels or some kind of protection. So, um, you know, rain free water um, sometimes can suppress this. And then in terms, there's plenty of organic fungicides that work pretty well if you're seeing this problem. Um, so we went through this pre-bloom phase, and I think we've covered sort of those recommendations if you need to get some fungicides out there. Um, and you were hopefully at this pre-bloom phase continuing to look for those same ins insects. And you know, this is your last chance to get out an insecticide before you really start having some bloom. Um, and then at full bloom, we're kind of looking for the same things. There's no majorly new things um, in that full bloom period. Um, and I will note here for the, the diseases, um, like I mentioned with the botrytis, and then there's this other anthracnose fruit rot uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, those are not showing symptoms. You can't really scout for the symptoms. It's more if you know you're having rainy, weather that's going to be conducive for infection, you kind of need to get out there with some um, fungicides to prevent it. Because by the time you see the moldy fruit in the fields uh, during harvest, you could try to remove the stuff that's, that's moldy and you know, hope that you know, additional berries are not going to be infected, um, but it, it can be hard to manage at that point. Um, okay, so now you're going, you've got fruit out there, you're, it's turning from green to white to red. Um, so there's some additional things to look at during this stage. Um, so you, again, you're going to now be looking for botrytis in its um, sporulating form, which is that, that gray mold um, for the, some other fruit rots, and then some additional pests that start showing up once you have ripe fruit. Um, slugs, which can be a far more devastating pest in strawberries than most people realize. And I don't know if you've ever been out picking and you flip over a berry and it's just like eaten out and really gross. That is your garden slug. And they usually are active more in the, the nights and in the mornings um, when it's cool and, and moist, but they can certainly do a lot of damage. Um, so, and for those, there's various slug pellets. Um, sometimes people will even put up a little fence or, you know, if you're growing them up on a raised bed or in a, um, some kind of raised bed, you're less likely to see slugs, um, but they can certainly be a problem. So if you're seeing that kind of damage on your strawberries, that's what it is. Um, 
In thracnose fruit rot, it's, so this is a different disease than <clears throat> the gray mold. And you'll see the main thing is it's kind of a, a sunken brownish um, lesion that you get here. Um, sometimes it can be kind of wet um, and it can certainly be a devastating disease. And then another one is leather rot and tends to be more of a drier type lesion. Um, and one of the challenges with this disease is it's not just a, you know, may not look like, well, that's not a significant issue. It makes the fruit taste disgusting. So it's more than just a little bit of rot. It can really, even when it's, you know, not, you know, very severe looking, the infection is well through that fruit and can make it really unpleasant and unmarketable. Um, so to manage these fruit rots, um, one of the big things that we always say is don't use nitrogen fertilizer in the spring. We, strawberries do need nitrogen, but we try to give that more in the summer and the fall. Um, so just to not have an oversized plant. That's really what it comes down to is we don't want it to be too vigorous, too thick because um, that provides those wet, humid conditions that encourages these diseases. And then you definitely want to be controlling weeds. Um, again, to just allow more airflow and let things dry out. Um, plastic and straw mulch. So you minimize the soil contact because some of the spores from the diseases are coming from the soil. Um, this is a really key piece is the sanitation. So you want to get all of the ripe fruit. And if you're seeing infected, damaged fruit like this, don't just like, ew, I'll leave it. Take it out because that's going to be a source of infection for your developing berries. So this berry could be a good berry, except, you know, with it so close to um, these really awful moldy ones, by the time it's getting ripe, it's also probably going to have disease. Um, and we've talked about spraying for gray molds. Um, for the other fruit rots, the cultural controls are probably the best management. Um, if you're having a lot of rain during the harvest season, you can have a lot of issues. So that might be a time to do some sprays, you know, fungicide sprays. Um, during the harvest period to, you know, if you've seen this, you remove those bad berries and then um, hopefully protect these developing berries so that by the time they are getting ripe, that they also, you don't also have that problem. Um, another pest that I see quite a bit, and this is more showing up during harvest and then later on into the summer, are these potato leaf hoppers. And at first glance, this can look like a nutritional deficiency. You just see these yellow splotchy leaves and you think, oh, they look hungry. Um, but the key here is sort of the, they start to crinkle. You'll see some malformation in those leaves. Um, and so potato leaf hoppers are a common pest of, of many vegetable and even field crops. So yeah potatoes, alfalfa, <laughs> um, you know, many vegetable crops. So they can certainly move around. Um, so sometimes we see the most damage in strawberries if there was a, a, a nearby alfalfa field that was mowed um, for first cutting of hay and, and all the leaf hoppers fly up and, and land in your strawberries. Um, but this can, and they will stunt the plants and, and cause problems. So these are ones that we definitely want to be scouting for. And you, again, you're looking at the underside of the leaf. So you're looking for these little light green guys and the adults will fly away. So they can be hard to spot, but the nymphs are more of what you're seeing here and they'll tend to move sideways. Um, so that can be an easy way to spot them if you don't happen to have your lens with you um, to distinguish them from, from other pests that might be there. Um, and so, yeah, so we've kind of covered all of that. I guess some of the key things to think about during fruit set and harvest um, is to keep things clean. If you're having a lot of rain and the plants seem like they're wet and staying wet, uh, maybe to use a fungicide. Um, and, you know, again, there's 
if you're using any kind of fungicide or insecticide, um, be aware of the reentry interval and the pre-harvest interval. Um, because if you're in the middle of harvest, it can be hard to say, okay, well, I'm going to spray this and then how long before I'm planning to harvest again. Um, and then in terms of, you know, after harvest with strawberries, if you're familiar with the matted row system is what we then call renovation where you're, uh, you mow off the leaves. Uh, maybe if you're growing them in the soil, you can throw some dirt over the crowns to encourage um, secondary crowns and runner production. And then this is a, a key time for weed management and some disease management. So if you had noticed some disease issues on your leaves, your crowns, um, this is the time to do that. Um, and then as those uh, plants regrow through the rest of the season, it can be easy to forget about them. Um, but if you know you have issues, particularly with the leaf spots, this is an important time uh, to you know, maybe get a, a fungicide out to protect those. And then often you don't need to use any kinds of insecticides unless you're seeing major issues with potato leaf hoppers or spider mites or aphids. Um, and then there's a couple other pests which are generally considered minor ones, but I wanted to mention them because this is where you might see some feeding in the summer. Um, this is very severe damage. Um, this was in Wyoming County um, where a grower had a lot of this strawberry rootworm, um, which is a little beetle and it's generally not a severe pest, but for whatever reason, it went crazy and just really ate everything. Um, and then another one which causes similar feeding damage of just, you know, kind of skeletonizing or, you know, eating little holes in all the leaves is this redheaded flea beetle. And again, we don't usually consider it a big problem in strawberries. It can be a very bad problem in other vegetable crops. And it seems to be if you're rotating strawberries into a previous vegetable field, this is where it's showing up. Um, and one of the big differences, I mean, they're kind of a different shape, a different size and color than the strawberry rootworm beetle. This is sort of small and um, kind of ovalish with, and brownish. And these are longer and shiny and black and they're jumpy. So if they're poppy, then it's not a rootworm, it's more likely a flea beetle. Um, so that is what we have um, in terms of the presentation, but I'll be happy. I think I'll show your videos so I can see, see your faces now um, and happy to try to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Esther. Well, no, no questions showed up in the chat. So Master Gardeners, anybody have a question? You can actually unmute if you'd like to and ask questions. Um, I did have one, Esther. Yeah. So for home gardeners that have a small plot of strawberries or even a container, if they start seeing funky leaves, does it help just to remove those leaves, especially if maybe it's a fungal disease starting and then keep an eye on it? I mean, I know you can't do that in a field, but mm -hmm. would moving, removing individual potentially infected leaves help, help a situation in a home garden? Um, it, it can. Um, particularly if it's the older leaves that are showing issues. I mean, sometimes they'll just start looking kind of yellowish or a little brown on the edges. That's probably just an old leaf and not a disease at all, or, you know, something starting to, you know, start to get some of those saprophytic fungi that come in. Um, so yeah, you can just remove something. Um, if you have just very minor feeding you might do that. I guess to me, I would always look at the overall vigor of the plant. If right. it feels like you're really scalping that plant, I might not remove leaves. Um, again, depending on how actively growing it is. Um, that's the whole thing with renovation is, you know, after harvest, and this is something I think probably most home gardeners don't do, but it might be a good thing to try is you could just do that with scissors and come in and snip off almost all the leaves, they really take it down to 
just above the crown. You don't want to cut into the crown, um, but you basically whack off all the leaves and encourage that plant to regrow. So that's one way to just remove a lot of inoculum and older stuff um, to, you know, kind of refresh that plant. Right. Um, and then a good, I mean, if you've got a four by four bed, a good cleanup mm -hmm. throughout the year and even yeah. into the fall would be also good for removing pests, all pests pretty much. Yeah. 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 Anytime you can keep it open. And that's where if the plants are super bushy, sometimes, yeah, removing the lower leaves, the older leaves that are probably less effective at, at that point, um, that can just help open up the plant. So you end up with less disease uh, pressure in there anyway, because things are just drying out a little better. Yeah. I just wondered, uh, what would be the two most common diseases and the two most common uh, pests in a typical growing year that we should uh, be aware of? Um, if you could just give us some, a guess, your best guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say in terms of the most devastating stuff, I think that gray mold gray on mold. the fruit, I mean, that's huge. You know, it's sometimes really hard to manage. And so that's where that sanitation is probably the key piece um, to, to get that off. Um, the fruits, the leaf spots in terms of another disease, they're very common. They're less yeah. important. I mean, most strawberry plants can handle a certain amount of spots. You know, they're just gonna be new leaves coming, um, mm -hmm. but it can get bad. Um, so, I mean, I think in terms of what most particularly gardeners are going to be worried about are the the molds on their fruit specifically like no one wants to see that um, and in terms of insects I think particularly from a home gardener perspective that uh, tarnished plant bug and that fruit that's you're seeing this like seedy tips and, and really malformed that's something that I think most people are going to find really unpleasant and not know the cause because it doesn't look like an insect. Um, they're just like, what's wrong with my fruit? But it was feeding on that, um, you know, berry or flower when it was quite small. Um, and in terms of this, I see a lot of the spider mites, you know, mm -hmm. even in commercial fields, I think it's one of the harder things to control. Um, so I think that's an important one and maybe one that people don't know to look for because you don't, it's not obvious feeding damage. You just, you're, it's stunting the plant and maybe your leaves don't look right. They look kind of yellowish or bronze kind of, but you don't know unless you know to flip it over and say, okay, what's mm -hmm. going on here? Um, okay. So that's important. Checking the back of the leaves is, is always yes. Fun. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the strawberry pests are not on the top of the leaf. You're not going to see them, obviously. You kind of have to flip it over and, and get down there in the crown or, you know, on the flower clusters um, to, to tap them out of the, the flowers to see what's going on there. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Thank yeah. you. So, so Esther, do the spider mites that infect strawberries, do they not do a lot of webbing then? Do you notice the webbing if it's a severe infestation? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, really okay. Because lots of times I think people don't realize they have them till it's mm -hmm. to the point of the plants looks like some giant spider has moved in. Right, yeah. You don't want it to get that bad for sure. Um, okay. But yeah, it can... I mean, like I said, the threshold for control is five mites per leaf. At that point, there's no webbing. Right, okay. Um, but it can get there fast and they, they really like hot, dry weather. So if you have even a, a moderate infestation in the spring, when I'm suggesting to be looking for it, by the time you get to July, then you have webbing, then you have a mess. <laughs> right, right. Um, so you have to keep keep looking for yeah. those through the whole season. Yeah. Especially later in the summer when we get that hot, dusty, dry period. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Other questions? Anything else on strawberries? You know, I get lots of questions about fertility and- um, this, is, this is Gordon. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of these problems could be the same, 
I know these are for cultivated strawberries that we're talking about, but wild strawberries would have some of these same problems. Am I yes. correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I reckon I recognize some of the some of the different symptoms of of the. Uh, yes. I have lots of wild strawberries, and and some of them act just the same as what you're describing. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And many of them affect other crops as well. I mean, some of them I mentioned, but even within um, berry crops, raspberries have a lot of the same issues. Um, so you'll see those there as well. Um, one thing I didn't get into, this was more talking about uh, the June bearing strawberries, but if you're growing ever bearing strawberries, and those are pretty common for home gardeners, um, so something you might see in a garden center and they're advertised as being like, you get season long berries and that it's true. They can be really nice for a home garden because you're gonna have fruit for a longer period, not just you know for the three weeks in June. Um, but you run into a different complement of pests and diseases as you go into the whole summer. Um, so some of the things that we run into, you're gonna have SWD, spotted wing drosophila, becomes a bigger issue as you get into the later summer. Um, for the early strawberries, you really avoid that pest. Um, but once you're, yeah, if you have July, August, September berries, you're going to be fighting SWDs. So you're going to see you know, potentially larva in your berries. If you're not against that sort of that clean picking becomes really important. Um, and I see a lot more um, that, that tarnished plant bug, like I said, it doesn't go away. It just keeps reproducing, <laughs> you know, multiple generations. So um, that can build up more and be harder to manage getting into those, you know, and then how do you spray? Because you have continual bloom on those ever bears. So it's not as simple as like, okay, well, we just need to get something out, you know, before or after bloom. Um, the ever bears continuously bloom all summer. So it's hard to know when to do your protection. Yeah, Esther, what would you recommend to the home gardener? The early bearing or uh, do, do you avoid some of the uh, problems if you have your fruiting early in the season? Absolutely, you're, you're definitely going to avoid some of the issues. Um, but again, I, th I think for the June bearers, for the, the, the early summer strawberries, um, that's a multi-year planting system. And it works generally better in soil than in a pot. Um, it, it can certainly work in a raised bed. So thinking of it from a gardening perspective, that's something you want in the soil so that it'll overwinter better. If you're trying to grow something in a pot on your patio, that's where the ever bears seem to work a little bit better in that system um, because you're kind of rotating that through and you get that fruit the same year that you planted the plant. Are the ever bearers, are they just a one year plant? Then I don't know that much about strawberries. Yeah, generally they are. Um, you could certainly try to overwinter them and they will have a crop the following spring, kind of about the same time as the June crop. Um, <clears throat> the fruit size tends to be a lot smaller on the ever bearers if you try to overwinter them. Um, and usually people aren't getting more than that second spring off of the ever bearers and then they'll just replace the plants. Mm -hmm. Esther, is that true even if they're in the ground for the ever bearers? Usually, usually. Um, it, <sighs> Yeah, the fruit size is the key. It's not that the plants couldn't survive and, and produce, um, but for whatever reason, they just try to make so much flour <laughs> at that point that um, trying to get a second summer crop off of them, um, I just don't. So they kind of peter see out. That happening. I don't hear people saying like, oh, I'm, I'm having a lot of success okay. doing it that way. It's how you want to market. And that's why I say for a homeowner, uh, sometimes those ever bearing strawberries are really nice because you're getting not a lot, but a few berries, you know, maybe every week through the whole summer. And that can just be nice to have on your cereal or whatever. Yeah, just go pick a handful. Right. Yeah. Or yeah, just eat them 
out there in the garden. Yeah, nothing's better than strawberries from your own garden. Yeah. Well, Esther, this was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. One of the key points is ID your pest and your problems. And, you know, that's what helplines for. 